Good evening. My name is Billy Weitzer. I'm the executive director of the Leo Beck Institute, and I welcome you to the Leo Beck Institute and the Center for Jewish History. For those of you who don't know us, the center brings together five partner organizations, the American Jewish Historical Society, the American Sephardi Federation, Leo Beck Institute, YIVO, and the Yeshiva University Museum. I hope that while you're here, you'll explore the displays from the center throughout the building. But of course, tonight, I hope you'll see our exhibit that's based on the project 1938 Posts from the Past and our launch of that year-long project of the same name. I guess we can, like that, there we go. I will tell you more about uh, the project as we go along this evening. But first, let me tell you about a couple of events that are coming up at the Leo Beck Institute. On Sunday, March 18th at 2 p.m., we are going to tell the story of a Max Liebermann oil painting that is right now displayed on the mezzanine on the way to our exhibit. The painting is The Basket Weavers. It was owned by a David Friedman from Breslau and recently recovered by his great nephew, David Torin. Um, David Torin also recovered a Max Liebermann uh, that was stolen from his great uncle and was in the hands of the Gurlitt collection. Um, on that afternoon, the Torin family will tell the story of these two paintings and will also discuss looted art in general. It, it is in a smaller venue, so please make your um, reservations in advance. Two days later, on March 20th, the mother-daughter team of Gra Gabrielle Rosmer Gropman and Sonia Gropman are going to discuss their book, The German Jewish Cookbook. Um, and uh, joining them will be Gefilteria's Jeffrey Yaskowitz and historian Atina Grossman, who is here tonight. She is from Cooper Union. The cookbook features recipes for German Jewish cuisine as it existed in Germany prior to World War II, as well as how the refugees later adapted it in the United States and elsewhere. So if you're interested, please register for that. But tonight's program is about the 1938 project it touches on the commemoration of the 80th year since the events of 1938. We chose to link it to a significant event of 1938. In two weeks, we will have the 80th anniversary of the Anschluss, Nazi Germany's invasion of Austria, which was, you might say, the first major event of a year full of major events. On the morning of March 12th, the German army crossed the border into Austria. Quickly, Germany annexed Austria, and just as quickly, the Jews of Austria were subjected to the same prejudice, mistreatment, and discriminatory laws that had been gradually taking hold in Germany for five years. Tonight, we will hear from the Austrian Consul General in New York, Helmut Beck, and Professor Marsha Rosenblatt about this historic event, as well as our contemporary perspectives on the events of 1938. After they have spoken, I'll return to the stage and tell you more about this exciting project. But first, I am honored to introduce our two speakers. Dr. Helmut Birk is an Austrian diplomat who has held post as Consul General in Hong Kong, Ambassador to the Republic of Korea, Head of the Department of International Organizations at the Ministry for Foreign Affairs um, in Vienna, I presume, yes, I lost my place, and Permanent Representative of Austria to the United Nations in Vienna. He holds a doctoral degree in law, he also earned a master's degree in international relations from the London School of Economics and a postgraduate certificate of advanced European studies from the College of Europe in Bruges. Immediately following the Consul General will be Professor Marcia Rosenblatt, a social historian of Jews in Central Europe who earned her PhD at Columbia. Dr. Rosenblatt has been at the University of Maryland since 1978, serving as the director of the Meyerhoff Center for Jewish Studies from 1998 to 2003 and currently as a director of graduate studies of the history department. She is the author of several books, The Jews of Vienna, 1867 to 1914, Assimilation and Identity, Reconstructing a National Identity, The Jews of Habsburg, Austria during World War I. And in addition, she has edited Constructing Nationalities in East Central Europe and published over 30 scholarly articles on a range of Jewish topics related to Central Europe. Please welcome our two distinguished guests. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure being here. I normally 
uh, start my speeches with, uh, with some excuses. Uh, uh, my generation in Austria was actually educated in the linguistic capability school like Arnold Schwarzenegger. Um, so if you hear a rather clear Austrian accent, forgive me, but I'll never try, uh, try to sort of, you know, uh, explain in a more or less intelligible way what I wanted to say. Um, first of all, um, to the executive director of the Leo Beck Institute, uh, Dr. Billy Weinzer, thank you very much to you and your team, uh, also for this exhibition. Um, and for your efforts, uh, the way NIC is to help us all to get a clearer understanding uh, also in history's lesson. Um, I'm a typical example of what they call a, a post-war Austrian. I went to school in Austria in the 60s and 70s. Uh, and then whenever my generation sort of met uh, and talked about history and history lessons, um, what we realized is very often our history lessons seem to have a tendency to end with 1918. Uh, you know, you got everything from the Persians, the Roman empires, um, Middle East, what have you, all kind of cultures, but as soon as the Habsburg Empire sort of fell, um, there seemed to have been a lag. It was my generation who sort of challenged more and more, in particular our respective teachers, um, that in order to understand, in particular, the 20th century in Austria, uh, one had to face up to one's history. Uh, Austria and the Austria I represent as a diplomat and have been doing it for over 30 years has come a long way, not only to facing up its history, um, but to also educate uh, the young generations in Austria. Uh, one small example I sort of um, refer to in particular when I'm here at the Leo Beck Institute, that presently there are two young Austrian ladies who are actually doing what we call a commemorative year, a voluntary social year uh, at the Leo Beck Institute. Uh, and I guess that shows also not only their interest, but the interest of a young generation in Austria. Um, with regard to, to the Austrian history and in particular to what and how we see the Leo Beck Institute, let me first of all uh, say that I believe that the Leo Beck Institute uh, provides an invaluable service in preserving, in particular through archival work, an understanding of the disastrous impact uh, of National Socialism and National Socialism had on Jewish life. The exhibition, which you will see, and I just had a, a glimpse of it, and Dr. <coughs> Reitzer told me about it um, over the past couple of months, I think is an excellent uh, example of the Institute's works. The exhibits and the accompanying website uh, offer a glimpse into the terror of the early days of National Socialism in Austria, as well as into the richness of individual lives forever upended by the so-called Anschluss. At the Austrian Consulate General here in New York, uh, we have the privilege of seeing similar documents uh, as the ones on display here and on the website. Uh, survivors uh, and their descendants have kept them very often meticulously safeguarded um, in protective sleeves uh, as treasured memories of their relatives and as a testimony of the daily anxiety and the dangers they had to undergo before they were allowed to emigrate, if they were fortunate and lucky, or murdered, if they were not. Some of these documents we also see testify to the heartbreaking efforts of children uh, trying to save their parents, aunts, their nephews, and young men, their future wives. They are also a sobering reminder, we feel, of the important role of some consulates in Europe and the Americas which they played and they have played in allowing those persecuted to reach safety. The many letters uh, are witnesses to the anguish which accompanied the decision to emigrate. Happy recollections of their life in Vienna, for example, uh, very vivid in the minds of very many survivors, who despite the cruelty that followed, often passed those memories on to their children. This in turn brings them uh, to the Austrian Consulate General to reclaim their Austrian heritage in seeking citizenship, compensation, or simply an encounter with fellow Austrians. I felt that their willingness to come to terms with a painful past and reach out to Austria is both humbling and encouraging to my team. Exhibitions like these, we feel, serve to link the historical events with an insight into the many personal tragedies caused by them, a linkage that today remains as important as it was in 1938. Whilst the exhibition allows us to acknowledge the unique catastrophe that was the Holocaust 
Empathy for human suffering today is indispensable if we want to prevent such terrible times to return. I would expect the exhibition has much to teach us and of course the younger generation. I would like to thank the Leo Beck Institute, Dr. Weitzer and his team of offering this opportunity to reflect anew about this tragic moment in Austrian and European history, to pay tribute to its victims and draw our lessons for today's times. Thank you. I'm shorter. <laughs> I'm delighted to be here too, and I, I want to thank the Leo Beck Institute for inviting me to speak about this, uh, uh, well, not about the project, but about 1938 in uh, Austrian Jewish history. I'd like to begin by talking about the experiences of two Viennese Jews at the time of the Anschluss in March of 1938. The first, a man, and the second, a woman. Um, the first is George Clare, or that's what he called himself after he moved to England. In Vienna, he was Georg Clare. But uh, Georg Clare, uh, who, writing in his memoirs written around 1980, um, or in the 70s, uh, writing in his memoirs of events in Austria between March 11th and 13th at the time of the Anschluss noted, and I quote, the paradox of Vienna's outburst of popular anti-Semitism at the time of the Anschluss was that it saved thousands of Jewish lives. The lousy anti-Semitism of the Germans, he said earlier in the memoir that Germans were good Nazis and bad anti-Semites and the, the Austrians were bad anti-Semites and good, and bad Nazis and good uh, anti-Semites, which isn't really true actually, but nevertheless that's what he said, so I'm just citing his, his words. The lousy anti-Semitism of the Germans led many German Jews to believe that they could go on living in their beloved Germany while the first-class anti-Semitism of the Austrians left no Jews in any doubt, uh, left no Jew in any doubt that he had to get out of the country as quickly as possible. He was exaggerating, of course, on all levels, about everything. But nevertheless, he was, I think, expressing a truism um, about how Viennese Jews experienced the Anschluss. It scared them to death, and they wanted to leave Austria right away. The second memoirist that I want to uh, cite is a woman named Minna Lox, um, also a Viennese Jew. She was a socialist um, and a um, uh, high school teacher. And she, so she was a little bit older at the time of the Anschluss. Claire, or Claire was 17 at the time of the Anschluss. She was probably in her late 20s, maybe in her early 30s. Um, uh, she was very, she had been even more upset, uh, well maybe not more, but very upset with Austria's turn to Austro-fascism and authoritarianism in 1934, 1933 and 34, and with the destruction of Austrian democracy at that point. And she felt in 1934 that she should emigrate. And she wrote in her, in her memoirs, um, I knew then, and she's talking about 1934 when Austria was not part of Germany and when it wasn't under the rule of the Nazis, I knew then that very soon we would have to leave our beautiful and so beloved city, unquote, that she was talking about Vienna. But she and her husband didn't leave in 1934. They left right after the Anschluss. Um, uh, when everyone, that is, other Jews and other socialists, not just Jewish socialists, but all socialists, or many socialists, wanted to leave. Um, well, maybe not everyone, not the old who couldn't leave uh, or for whom Austria was too beloved to leave. But she, a, com a, a committed socialist, did not dwell on the anti-Semitism the way that Claire did. Um, she just emphasized in her memoirs the horror of the pro-Nazi feeling that she experienced in Austria at the time of the Anschluss and the unbounded jubilation of, of, of those who considered themselves, that, that is those Austrians, and she excludes her socialist friends, but um, those other Austrians who considered themselves to have gone home to the Reich. 
Um, she retained her faith, by the way, in that other Austria, the democratic Austria, the socialist Austria, and she and her husband actually returned after World War II to rebuild, um, to rebuild Austria. Anyway, um, so two different versions of the same thing, right? The Anschluss was terrible and Jews needed to leave. They had the same reaction even though they came from different political points of view and different um, understandings of exactly what was going on. There was indeed, at the time of the Anschluss in March of 1938 in Austria, an outpouring of Austrian anti-Semitism. Um, and in fact, historians have called this period in March, April, May of 1938, the Anschluss pogroms, that is, um, violence directed against Jews um, in Austria, spontaneous violence by ordinary um, Austrians, not ordinary ones, ones that shared Nazi ideology or, or, um, uh, or anti-Semitic views. Um, Austrian Nazis and others in the street, um, it, it, you know, ran through the streets screaming, uh, George Clare tells us, uh, Jude Ferreca, you know, a, a parish, uh, Jews perish. Um, they beating up Jews, humiliating Jews in the streets, forcing them to clean, clean the streets because there were all these election, there was supposed to have been a plebiscite between the uh, Austro-fascists and the Nazis and, and uh, it, that didn't happen, and, uh, but there were lots of electioneering slogans in the streets and Jews had to clean them up. Um, there was also in Vienna, besides this outpouring of, of sort of anti-Semitic energy, um, there were also concerted Nazi efforts to Aryanize the economy quickly. Um, in, in Germany itself, that had been a process that is getting Jews out of the economy, forcing Jews to sell their businesses or liquidate their businesses and so forth. That had been a slow and gradual process, which sped up in 1938 and became concerted policy after Kristallnacht. Um, a forced Aryanization became the norm after Kristallnacht in November. But from the moment of the Anschluss in Austria, there were enormous efforts by the, Nazi, the new Nazi authorities to, quick, to quickly Aryanize the economy and for, not only to Aryanize the economy, but to make Jews leave, to make them feel that what they should do is leave. Um, and this was more vigorously implemented and implemented earlier than in Germany, where it was Nazi policy in 1938 as well, but, um, but had been sort of a more gradual process. There was also, as we'll see in a moment, the uh, importance of the presence of Eichmann. Eichmann, um, who was head of the Jewish desk in the Gestapo in Nazi Germany, he came to Vienna to make sure that Aryanization and forced emigration really was done properly. Um, more importantly, perhaps, all of these Nazi, uh, all of the Nazi anti-Jewish measures that had been um, gradually imposed in Germany, getting Jews out of culture, getting Jews out of public life, getting Jews out of uh, 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 high schools and universities, all of those things, that uh, the Nuremberg laws, get, which were the racial laws to get Jews out of the fabric of German society, that had been done gradually and slowly in Germany, and it was all imposed at once in Austria. Um, uh, it was done right away. And all of this, the, the speed, the, the, the anti-Semitic uproar, uh, the, the speed of Aryanization and, and the pressure to emigrate, uh, the presence of Eichmann, the, 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 the fact that all of the Nazi measures were at once, um, all of this scared Jews into seeing imminent danger and the need to leave, and so they worked hard to do so. Now, of course, Jews in Germany also left before 1938, but only in 1938 with increased uh, Aryanization, and especially after Kristallnacht, with the violence of that night and, and the imposition of forced Aryanization, did Jews realize that they needed to leave. Um, but Austrian Jews felt the need to leave right away because everything was done at once. They had observed what had been going on in Germany, um, uh, and they experienced it in a more immediate and uh, violent way. 
Okay, let me stop for a minute and tell you a little bit about the Jews of Austria, um, because you know they're not exactly the same as the Jews in Germany. There were about 200,000 Jews in Austria, almost all of whom lived in Vienna, right? Um, most of the, virtually all the Jews of Austria, of interwar Austria, lived in the city of Vienna where they formed eight to 9% of the population. There were Jewish communities outside of Vienna. There was several thousand Jews in Graz. There were um, Jews in other cities, but those other Jewish communities were really very tiny. Salzburg, for example, had, I think, 293 Jews. Right, so Vienna was, Austrian Jews were in Vienna, um, virtually all of them. Um, most of the Jews in Vienna, not all, but most of the Jews in Vienna were the descendants of Jews who had, or the Jews themselves, who had migrated to Vienna after 1848. Um, Vienna, like many Central European cities, didn't allow Jewish settlement until the freedom of movement was decreed with the revolution of 1848, and then lots of Jews came to Vienna. They came mostly from what is today the Czech Republic, but the provinces of Bohemia and Moravia. They came from Hungary, which is very close to Vienna, uh, or was close to Vienna before there was this thing called Slovakia, but Slovakia was part of Hungary before 1918. Um, so, um, uh, Bohemia, Moravia, Hungary, and they came from Galicia, which was a part of Poland that ha came into the Habsburg monarchy, came into Habsburg, Austria, um, when Poland ceased to exist at the end of the 18th century. Um, but these people, whether they came from Bohemia and Moravia or Hungary um, or, or, or Galicia, were, they were Austrian citizens. Well, actually, the Hungarians were technically not Austrian citizens, but almost. Um, there were also in Vienna, um, in, the, there were in the interwar period, um, people who had come as refugees during World War I uh, to Vienna, mostly from Galicia, uh, that part of Poland, and from Bukovina, which was a province near Galicia, some of which was in interwar Romania, some of which was in Ukraine. It's a complicated place. But in any case, they were refugees uh, from during the war. When they arrived in Vienna, they were Austrian citizens, but they were no longer Austrian citizens um, uh, in the interwar period because Austrian law said that in order to be an Austrian citizen, you had to have been in Vienna before August 1st, 1914. Um, so the people from Bohemia, Moravia, hung uh, Hungary too, and, and, and Galicia were grandfathered in if they came before World War I, but not if they came during the war. Um, and most of those people, that is the World War I refugees who stayed, a lot of them went home or went on to America, but the ones who stayed in, in Vienna, um, they were mostly Polish citizens, which, which made leaving really hard. Right? Because as many of you know, while the quotas, the immigration quotas for people from Germany were quite low, the ones from Poland were much, much, much lower still. So it was really hard. Okay, in terms of their social profile, um, some were middle class, some were poor, unlike in Germany where before uh, the Nazi rise to power, most Jews, virtually all Jews were middle class. They ranged across the religious spectrum, some religious, some not religious. They ranged across the political spectrum in terms of their political loyalties. They ranged across the Zionist, non-Zionist, anti-Zionist spectrum. I mean, they, they, they came in all flavors. Some of them were highly assimilated um, to Austro-German culture. Um, some of them were much less assimilated to Austro-German culture. Some of them were assimilated into it, but still lived in an entirely Jewish milieu. Others were much more integrated into the general Austro-German milieu. Um, there were, of course, many very famous participants, Jewish participants in culture. Uh, but they were not typical, necessarily, Viennese Jews. They were, though, all, I would say, um, they all shared, most of them anyway, um, a loyalty to Austria. Certainly, they had been very loyal to the Habsburg monarchy before World War I and during the war years. But in the interwar period, they, were, they still remained um, very loyal to Austria. They were not happy with the rise of Austrofascism in the 1930s, but they supported it because they knew, they, and they were correct in this knowledge, that um, if they didn't support it, or that if it didn't exist, the next thing coming would be the Nazis. And they were right you know, to, to fear the Nazis. 
um, the, the leaders of the sort of uh, Austria, the independent Austrian uh, state before the Nazi uh, uh, takeover were certainly uh, right wing. Many of them were anti Semitic, but they certainly didn't share Nazi um, furious uh, anti Jewish animosity. <clears throat> Excuse me. Interestingly, though, and this is the, sort of the last thing I want to say just in general about the Jews of Vienna, the Jews in Vienna, of course, spoke German, but unlike most Austrians in interwar Austria, they always opposed Anschluss with Germany. A, a lot of Austrians supported Anschluss, including the socialist left, that is before the Nazis. Uh, the socialists didn't support Anschluss after the Nazis came to power in Germany. But before that, there was this sense, you know, if that they were Germans in the sense of an ethnic, um, linguistic, cultural identity, and they should be part of Germany. Um, and the, they weren't allowed to be by the, by the Paris uh, peacemakers after World War I. Um, Jews never really felt that way. They felt German in the sense of culture and, um, and uh, language, but not in the same way as many others saw. Uh, belonging to Germany. They were loyal to Austria, and they kind of liked the memory of the, of the monarchy um, very, very much. Um, yet, therefore, it's interesting that they left so easily. I, I mean, I do find that interesting. They had this great Austrian loyalty, and yet, as soon as there was Anschluss with Germany, with Nazi Germany, uh, as soon as there was this union with Nazi Germany, um, engineered, by the way, by Austrian Nazis, right? Um, and Austrian Nazis with the help of German Nazis. Um, the, as soon as this happened, there was this immediate thought, we have to leave here, even though before, the, before 1938 they had hoped to stay. So let me raise two important questions and then try to answer them briefly. Why was 1938 worse in Austria than in Germany before Kristallnacht? Obviously, after that, it's the same, but, but before Kristallnacht. And why did more Jews, or at least a higher percentage of Jews, actually leave? Uh, I, I've seen conflicting numbers, but basically two-thirds of the Jews of Austria managed to leave before 1941, I mean, through 1941. They didn't all leave in 38, but before the Nazis started deporting the Jews to the east. Um, so that means about 130,000 Jews actually left. Now, not all of them to safety. Some of them may have been in France or Czechoslovakia, where they were then deported later. But still, a higher percentage of Jews did manage to leave and leave to safety than elsewhere in the German Reich. So how do we answer those questions? Why was it worse and why did more leave? Um, of course, obviously, maybe they left because it was worse. But, um, but why, did, why was it worse and, and why did they leave? I'm not quite sure why it was worse. Um, I, I don't know that I can answer that question so easily. But why they felt the need to leave, I think, is easier to answer. Um, I think, as I've said in my introductory statements, the all at once nature of it really uh, was very important. The jubilation of the Austrians with the Anschluss, after all, a million people greeted Hitler in Heldenplatz in Vienna. That's a lot of people. There were two million people in Vienna. A million of them greeted him. You know, that's a lot. Um, the, uh, the jubilation of Austrians with the Anschluss and the concomitant release of anti-Semitic energies, and not just by Nazi party people but, and SA members, but by, in some cases, ordinary Austrians. Um, I think also that there were concerted Nazi efforts to affect the goals of 1938-39 in Vienna, in Austria, uh, well, in Vienna. Um, uh, that is, the Aryanization, that is, getting Jews out of the economy and encouraging Jews to leave, forced emigration. Um, this was done in a more concerted and methodical way, I think, in Austria, at least in the first part of 1938. By, by the latter part of 1938, it was probably similar in both parts of the Reich. Um, the arrival of Eichmann was part of that. Um, he was, the, as I said, the head of the Jewish desk at the Gestapo. He came to Vienna on the 16th of March. The Anschluss was the 11th through the 13th, um, and he came on the 16th. And he 
And there was this concerted effort um, to organize Aryanization. Commissioners were appointed and all sorts of organizations to, you know, to encourage and to facilitate the sale of Jewish property. Um, all of procedures were adopted, which became models in the rest of the German Reich. Eichmann himself was mostly involved with emigration at forcing Jews to leave, and, or at least encouraging Jews to leave. Um, he worked closely with the Jewish community of Vienna, the Israelitische Kultusgemeinde, and its leaders, Joseph Löwenherz and others, Desiree Friedman, to encourage the Jews to leave. He worked closely with the Zionists as well the, uh, to encourage Jews to leave. Um, he established also uh, the Central Office for Jewish Emigration, which created a kind of conveyor belt or a one-stop shopping uh, situation where um, uh, you know, Jews could enter uh, and in one day, you know, by going from desk to desk to take care of all the paperwork that they had to take care of to get an emigration permit, not the visa to another country was a separate issue. But, you know, the police report that they were okay and the report that their taxes were paid up and all of those things could be done in one location in one day. Um, and... Um, this was copied. I mean, Heydrich thought, oh, that's a good idea, and he adopted it for all of Germany in January of 1939. But it was first done in Vienna, and it was done right away in April, uh, March, April of 1938. So I think those are important considerations on the Nazi side. And then on the Jewish side, there was um, just the nature of the Jewish community itself. Um, there were more Eastern European Jews um, and and, and that not, that's not to say that they're smarter or whatever, but they may have been more attuned to the dangers of anti-Semitism than German Jews were. Um, they were more religious Jews. Uh, not that most Jews were religious, but I think that the percentage of religious Jews in Vienna was higher because of the Galician Jews and the Hungarian Jews. Um, there may have been more Zionists. All of these are groups suspicious of anti-Semitism in ways that your ordinary liberal German or Austrian Jew might not be quite as suspicious um, of. Um, I think the fact that they're also almost all in the same city may have had an impact. I mean, really, there were not very many Jews outside of Vienna, 10,000 maybe altogether. Um, most of the Jews in Austria lived in Vienna. And they were there together. They tended to cluster in certain neighborhoods. Um, they, they, they probably uh, egged each other on sounds too nasty, but they, they, the concentration probably facilitated a kind of joint decision to leave right away. So I was asked to only speak for 20 minutes, and I think I've come up to that point. But let me conclude by, by saying that um, those were very difficult, painful times. Families were separated, as we all know. That was true in Germany, of course, as well. Um, of course, Austria became part of Germany, so it's not really proper to say Germany and Austria. There was just one Germany after the Anschluss. But families were separ separated as some went to England and some went to Palestine and some went to America and some went to South America and so forth. Um, Viennese Jews or Austrian Jews, in fact, resemble Germ the rest of German Jewry or German Jews or Jew Jews in the Altreich, uh, as the uh, Viennese like to say. They, they, um, remem they resemble German Jews in the pain of leaving their homeland and, the, and their search for their new homes and the creation of new lives. But often they remain separate from the larger group of German refuge Jewish refugees since they were Austrian and Viennese. And while they spoke German, they weren't the same as other German Jews. So thank you very much. Thank you, Marsha, and for starting with some individual stories, but also giving a broader picture. So why 1938? Um, as you heard from the broader picture, you, you could start from the Anschluss and go all the way to Kristallnacht and in between 
the desperation that Germans and Austrians, maybe Austrians in greater numbers, felt. Um, the, the Avion Conference, which was an attempt to open up for uh, immigration and failed miserably. Um, then uh, the, the, the taking of the Sudetenland, um, the Polish action, and then of course Kristallnacht. And um, you know, one of the things that we are studying in this 1938 is what uh, German or Austrian could have imagined in early 1938 that they would put their um, children on a train to go away and perhaps never see them again. But by December 2nd, 1938, that was an al the only alternative for many and they put their children on the kinder transport. So um, I'd like to share with you some more personal examples, um, which you'll see in the exhibition, you'll see online. Um, we're handing out uh, little cards which tell you how to see our project online. So February 21st, um, like many others, Werner Danbich, a young jazz musician from Breslau, viewed Cuba as a waiting room on the way to his final destination, the United States. While his Cuban application was being processed, he also applied for a visa at the Colombian consulate, just to be on the safe side. The document presented here is a doctor's notice attesting to the perfect health of the prospective immigrant, one of the indispensable preconditions for receiving a visa. In April 1938, Dombich did reach the US by way of Cuba. Now our exhibit and also online, we do some world events, 36 of them to give a larger context. I'm not going to read about the Anschluss again since we've heard a lot about that. But moving on to a letter from May 26th. The writer of this letter thanks a Mr. Dilthey in Berlin for the distinction of having spent time with him and dramatically informs him of his Jewish identity. I am a Jew, a Jew in a desperate position, a Jewish German who in spite of everything that has befallen him or perhaps because of it cannot shed his ties to Germany. Denied his identity as a German by the Nazi regime, the writer communicates the crippling effects of the political situation on his psyche and the somewhat absurd notion of having to leave Germany in order to be a German. We also, of course, cover Kristallnacht as a major event. Again, rather than describing it, just to remind ourselves that the attacks are a turning point in two senses. First, they represent the moment in which mounting legal discrimination against, against Jews gives ways to state-sponsored mass violence. And second, for the Jews in both Germany and Austria, Austria, they are the decisive sign that emigration is the only hope for survival. Another example. The Feldstein family received good news that US American relatives were promising to issue affidavits and bring the family to America. Happiness and relief are reflected in this letter by little Gerta Feldstein to her uncle and aunt in Los Angeles, in which the 11-year-old thanks them for securing her family's move to the US. Gerta seems to have no doubt that things will work out. She even starts making plans to befriend her American cousins. But something must have gone wrong as Goethe was deported in June 1942 to Sobibor in Poland, where her fate is unknown. And one last example. Shortly after 16-year-old Heinz Ludwig Ketcher's arrival in England on a kinder transport, his father and mother sent him in this upbeat, loving letter, assuring him that he is constantly in their thoughts. His father mentions visas that are on the way from the US and that the prospects seem to make everyone more confident. Heinz was soon joined in England by his sister, Leanne. Both children were raised by foster families. Their parents never made it out of Germany and their children never saw them again. Using these personal stories, illustrated through programs, exhibitions, and digital content, the 1938 project illuminates the accomplishments of German Jews prior to the rise of the Nazis, the impact of the Nazi laws on individuals and families, and the escape or death of Germany's and Austria's Jews following the tragic events of 1938. So why are we doing this? I'd like to provide four reasons as you enjoy the, or at least see the exhibit and follow us online. 
First of all, telling history through personal stories. While our exhibit gives a teaser by presenting examples of, from the entire year, the website intentionally only reveals a day at a time with, and shows that nobody knew what was coming. The question is often posed as to why Jews did not immediately leave Germany under these circumstances, and Marcia covered some of this. While there are many answers, we, and many did leave, many believed that the Nazis would not remain in power, and most felt so German that they could not imagine how the noose would tighten in the ensuing years. Also, we want to demonstrate the importance of archives. It's significant that Kinder Transport is one of the final stories in 1938 for a second reason. Because they were children when they left Germany in Austria in 1938, these individuals will soon be the last living witnesses of the Holocaust. As we move to an era without witnesses, our archives must become the most important source of German Jewish history from the time of Moses Mendelssohn through the Holocaust. And on a more modern level, alluded to by our speakers, we are demonstrating that history matters today. The project makes it clear how important it is to recognize that German Jewish history is an integral part of German history and world history. These stories are not only acting as a powerful historical reminder for Germany today, but the personal accounts of discrimination persecution, expulsion, and forced migration, as well as resistance, persistence, and survival against the backgrounds of the events of 1938 provide important lessons for contemporary issues facing us today. Finally, speaking to new generations. Young people today see the 20th century as just another piece of history. How do we help them connect the importance of knowing history and using that knowledge today and into the future. I believe that 1938 Project provides a couple of answers to that question. First, by the use of social media. We are at the forefront of communicating with new generations. Second, I believe it is that personal stories provide a critical entryway to grasping the larger historical narrative. I want to acknowledge that we receive funding and support from a number of important organizations, not the least of which is our uh, partners who designed the website and the exhibit, CNG partners. And we also have at least 10 and a growing number of organizations that are adding to our collections of artifacts that will be revealed over the 365 entries of Project 1938. I also want to thank so many people on our staff, so please hold your applause, but at the end I want to give them a big one. Um, Magda Robel has really been the project director of this and has done a lion's share of the work related to it. Um, David Brown, our communications and programming director. Chris Bentley, our technical support. Uh, Miriam Bistrovich from Berlin, our Berlin representative. Emily Andrasini, who has done a lot of the photo processing. Um, we have two tremendous volunteers that have helped greatly, Barbara Schmutzler, Malgol Lacalards Duverge, and um, our leadership team, Frank Mecklenburg, who is the Director of Research, and Renata Evers, our Director of Collections. And then again, the CNG partners, especially Jonathan Alger and Maya Kopitman, who are here tonight. Um, and I really want to thank all these people for putting this project together. In closing, shortly after the Anschluss in April 1938, our namesake, Rabbi Leobeck, wrote to an emigre friend, and this year will be a difficult year. The wheel is turning faster and faster. It will really test our nerves and our capacity for careful thought. Rather amazing, quote, so by commemorating the year, the 80th year since the events of 1938, this project both reminds us of that eventful year and provides broader lessons for addressing contemporary issues. These stories from the individuals and families who were lost, who lost their livelihood, possessions, their rights, and in some cases their lives, are powerful reminders that the personal impact of historical events must be preserved and studied. I thank you very much and I hope you'll join us at the reception and also come up and see the exhibit. Thank you. <laughs>